In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to stop right there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word and the fact that we serve a God who speaks directly into human situations, into human history, and speaks for the transformation of individual people as well as whole societies, that the promise of the kingdom of God might be made known to human people, that your kingdom in heaven might have its place here on earth. And Lord, we pray that a a little glimpse of that would be realized by us today, even as we hear and respond to your holy word. Your word is like a, a surgeon's scalpel, the author of Hebrews described it as, able to pierce through the dividing line between our thoughts and our actions, the intentions of our heart. Your word knows us even better than we know ourselves. And so we ask that it would be like that mirror that James described it as revealing things that should not be there. And we we pray that even as we abide in your word today, that Jesus, you would prune all of the things that are getting in the way of us being conformed into your image. You're the best thing that's ever happened to us, Lord. We wanna follow you, we wanna apprentice you, we wanna be your disciples, and we wanna see your will being carried out all throughout the nations, the world, down to right here in the, little city of Santa Barbara that we get to live in. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You ever get one of those itches that you just can't seem to scratch? There's like a, it was like a couple days ago that I I was itching on the back, uh, on my back, and I just couldn't reach it. I know that God has a sense of humor because there's about two or three inches of square footage on a person's back that none of your limbs can actually reach. And I think he has a sense of humor because that little square inch is always itching. Have you ever gotten an itch and you just try to scratch it and you can't reach it and it pops up somewhere else? Like your shoulder itches, you try to scratch your shoulder, your other shoulder itches. You feel like an ant is on your elbow and all of a sudden seconds later you feel like ants are all over you. You're like, there's no ants anywhere, but I'm suddenly just itching all over. The other day, I had this, this, this itching on the back, like on my back, and I was like, ah, I can't reach it. And I'm grabbing for tools. I'm like scrubbing my back on this tree, and it just wouldn't go away. Won't go away until I scratch that itch. And it's like that proverbial gold pot at the end of the rainbow. It gets farther and farther and farther away. I say all this because we're going to be looking for the next few minutes at the topic of faith as expressed in this woman Mary. And faith starts with an itch. Now for you, it might start in a variety of ways. That itch might uh, take the form of questions. You might never have had questions like this before in your life. All of a sudden, you might be asking big picture questions about the purpose of your life, why you're here, why certain things are happening, why the world is the way that it is, why God made you, is there a God, questions like that. It might take the, that itch might take the form of longing. For, uh, for example, you might have lived for years, maybe decades, just okay with life, and all of a sudden you wake up one day and there's this sense of restlessness deep within you that you just can't seem to satisfy. No matter how many times you try to scratch the itch, it just will not go away. For other people, that itch might take the form of hope. You just know that there's something out there bigger than what you're living for. You know that there's a reason to keep going, you just don't know quite what that is. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe an itch for some of you might not be hope, but desperation. You've seen things, you've done things, things have been done to you that have been so difficult and so trying and so tumultuous 
that you just, you're asking some of the same questions. There, there's got to be something better than this. Perhaps you're at the bottom of the food chain looking up, wondering, is there, is there more to this? Faith starts with an itch that can take different forms depending on who you are and where you've come from. But it's often God that gives you the itch to begin with. He's not the author of evil and suffering and problems, but he is the author of the itch. He created that one to two inch square footage on your back that you just can't reach. But it's annoying you. And it will bother you until you scratch it. I want to talk uh, for the, the rest of the rest of the time that I have about faith, how your faith grows, what your faith can do once you have it, and where to, where to anchor your faith in. What, how your faith grows. You just look at this verse that we opened with. I love this. Verse, verse 39 through 40. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Now, just keep in mind, what we looked at last week was uh, Mary's, Mary's whole world just got turned upside down. This is a young girl. She's about to marry a nobody in a nowhere town, uh, hopefully to have a quiet life in Nazareth, and all of this is predicated on her getting married. And this guy named Gabriel, an angel of the Lord, uh, threatens to uh, upset all of that by telling her she's going to be pregnant, and it's not going to be Joseph's threatens her entire livelihood, her future, and she hears that, and immediately, and we remember from last week, her response is one of faith. She says, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. I'm all in, God. You're saying this is going to happen to me? Even if it's to the end of my disgrace, I'm going to do it because you said. You said I'm going to do it. And look at her response in the next verse. Mary gets moving. She got one word from the Lord and she gets moving. And I love just the action involved in Luke's writing. Uh, She arose, she went with haste, she entered into Elizabeth's house, she greeted three times, we're told in this paragraph, the greeting, the greeting, the greeting. You almost have this picture of someone so excited that she can't stop talking to Elizabeth. And she's moving and doing and action oriented. And this is, this is a gal that if you, if you look at her life story and you look at her demeanor, she's a pretty contemplative type of person. She's very quiet, treasures things in her heart, except for this. Gets a word from the Lord. She still treasures it in her heart, but she's, she makes a beeline for Elizabeth. In the prior text, what we looked at last week was that Gabriel, when, when Mary was, was asking questions, she wanted to understand, how, how can this be? And Gabriel tells her, because nothing is impossible with God. God can do anything. But then he gives her a little, a little hint, just a, a, a little thing to track and to investigate. He says, look, before, before I talk to you, I talk to your, your, your relative Elizabeth, who's old and barren. And she's already pregnant because nothing is impossible with God. So he gives her a little uh, trail to follow, a little lead to follow. She immediately goes after Elizabeth. She immediately tracks down and investigates God's promise. How does faith grow? It seems to start, at least with Mary, by investigating what God has already said and done. Mary immediately makes a beeline for Elizabeth and just begins to just, just greets her and, and they're probably talking and she's asking, she's already asking questions of Gabriel. She's probably asking questions here with Elizabeth. They're talking about it. And I say this because some of you might think that asking questions about your faith betrays some form of sinister doubt. I grew up in a background where asking questions about your faith was a faux pas. That was not something that faithful, believing Christians did. We didn't investigate, we didn't ask questions, we certainly didn't doubt things or struggle. We just kind of suppressed those things to be good Christians. The dirty little secret in my upbringing was everybody had questions like that. But what we see with Mary is that God isn't afraid of her questions. God isn't afraid of your questions either. And I know some of you have some big ones, some doozies. You don't understand. Perhaps you're struggling a little bit. God's been doing this for a year or two. He's not afraid of your questions. If we can get anything from the story with Mary and how God, through Gabriel and through his spirit, has been treating Mary, 
He invites your questions. But notice that Mary treats her questions, her curiosity, in a different way than Zechariah did. Zechariah essentially said, prove it, God. Mary said, I wanna, I'm seeking understanding. Very two different ways of approaching this. God isn't afraid of Mary's questions and he's not afraid of your questions either. Scratch the itch. How do you investigate God's promises? In this case, God specifically tells Mary that something is gonna happen and she follows on that lead. For us, we have the entire Bible, the whole of God's revelation written to us about what God has done and what God is still doing and what God says to you and me. The very basis for the way that we should start is to examine God's word and look at what he's already said. He speaks today prophetically. He speaks to people's hearts and to their minds. We listen to those things too. But at the very basic level, we should be opening this thing up and asking, what does it say? What has God purposed? What is in this thing? I want to understand. I want to grow in it. How does your faith grow? How do you scratch the itch? By getting in God's word. This is the way that faith grows for people. At the very least is by getting in God's word. Paul the apostle would say in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, faith comes by hearing and by hearing through the word of Christ. Where does faith come from? It comes from hearing God's word. It comes from reading God's word. It comes from digesting the things that God has said, from getting it deep down inside and allowing faith to take root and to grow out of that deep soil. Some of you perhaps might be asking, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how. How do I start? Maybe you've even, tr- even tried to pick up this thing. You're like, there are 2,000 pages in this thing, 66 books. I've never read a book in my life. Where do I start with this thing? Okay, Obadiah. Oh, that was a terrible one. You know, <laughs> Edom, I don't understand any, whatever that's going on. Well, let's try Judges. Oh, that's even worse. You know. Maybe you don't even know where to start. I'll tell you where to start. Start with Jesus. The whole Bible is about Jesus. But some some of them are more directly and vividly about them, like the Gospels. If you want to start, I would suggest starting by reading a Gospel. Start tonight. I suggest reading either the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Mark. Mark, because it's the shortest, it's the most to the point, it feels urgent, and it's going to grab your attention. John, because it's more contemplative and experiential and personal. I suggest picking up a gospel if you've never picked up the Bible before in your life and just start reading one of those and look for Jesus. You don't have a Bible, grab one of ours in the foyer, take it home with you, start reading tonight. For others, you just need a plan. Uh, In a couple weeks, I'll talk about a, a reading plan for the next year, for 2018, starting in January. For some of you, this might be the thing that you need. We're gonna read through the whole New Testament together, okay? as a way of getting into the scriptures. But whatever it is, we have to open up this thing. This is God's word. This is his voice being spoken into dark hearts and dark places. And this is what changes people. This is what grows their faith. And this apprenticing of Jesus that we've been talking about, or being his disciples, is such a dynamic relationship, right? It's not really something that can be uh, simplistically boiled down to doing two or three things. In any way that a a normal relationship that you and I have can be boiled down to those things. If it's a a next door neighbor who's a close friend or your best friend or a spouse or your kid and you were told like, hey, just do these three things for 20 years and everything will be wonderful. Wonderful. You know, if I approach that, 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 that simplistic way with my wife, like, okay, I'm, I've only, I'm only gonna do three things for the rest of my marriage. I'm gonna wash the dishes, I'm gonna bring home the bacon, and I'm gonna not argue, right? That will not give us a thriving marriage. That'll be better than if I, than if I didn't do those things, but that is not the basis of a thriving marriage. Relationships are dynamic, It's a day-by-day basis. There's so many different situations that arise. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of uh, the need of being filled with the Spirit. Same with our kids. Same with our friendships. Same in the workplace. People are complex, nuanced, uh, deep individuals. 
and relationships are as well. And so, we can't just approach a relationship with God and say, do two or three things for the rest of your life. It's going to change a little bit. However, there are going to be some things that span everything. Some things that are going to be better than others. Uh, as a as kind of just an experiment, I, I, I opened up my journal a while back and I charted uh, from the time that I got born again at Reality Carpinteria about 12 years ago, I think it was, to now, writing down all the most formative events and actions or things that took place in my life that moved me forward in my discipleship to Jesus Christ. Now, there might be hundreds of things in like a decade, right? But I just was looking for those formative life-changing events, and some of them were huge, like the first time I got filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit, and some of them were small, like the one time this guy at a church told me to show up every Sunday at 5 a.m. to put flyers in the back of the seats. I wrote these things down. These were, the, these were things that would shape me for all the years to come, and I came up with at least 30, right? Dynamic changes with seasons, it changes with the stage that we are in our spiritual maturity, there's a lot of things that happen. But if I look at all of those 30 things, there was one thing that always is present, has something to do with God's word. If you look at the Bible, you see that there are so many things, Jesus had these dynamic relationships with his disciples, just as he has a dynamic relationship with us. But if you look at all the things that he does, there are certain things that pop to the surface as being more important than just anything else. It's the word of God. Paul would say all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, growing, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There were a lot of things that I wrote down in my own life that were so formative in my life, but the most important, I would have to say, looking at scripture, looking at my own experience, is God's word. How does faith grow? How do we begin to scratch the itch of our faith? Get in God's word. Faith starts with genuine investigation in what God said. We see Mary doing that. But here's what your faith can do as you begin to cultivate it. I love what uh, we, we see in verse 45. Listen to this. This is Elizabeth speaking to Mary in her kind of outburst of of gladness, she says, blessed is she, speaking of Mary, blessed are you, Mary, who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. In one single beautiful sentence, Elizabeth correlates believing or faith with blessing itself. To believe is to open the door of God's blessing in your life. They are interconnected. Now, I just wanna talk about both of those for a second. Believing is not the same as perhaps a lot of people today might think of it as kind of a cognitive, intellectual assent to a right answer. For example, you might believe in Jesus in this way. I believe that he's real and that he did certain things and that might not change your life a shred. But when we look at belief or faith in the Bible, it is inseparable from action. It's inseparable from obedience. There is no separation between I know that this is true and I am going to follow in it. So everywhere we see in the, in, the, in the New Testament, we see acts of faith being followed by action. So we're not just to get into the word and investigate it, but we're also to do what it says. That's what it means to have faith and to believe in the promises of God. And we see this in the scripture, we see this in Jesus who in Matthew chapter seven, verse 24, and this is after he gave the Sermon on the Mount, arguably one of the most famous sermons, certainly one of the most famous sermons by Jesus or anyone in history, probably a sermon that he gave everywhere he stopped, that's what a lot of people think, is that he gave some variation of the Sermon on the Mount everywhere he went. And it was a sermon that basically described what the kingdom of God looked like when it touched societies of people, and he would go around preaching the good news of the kingdom. And after he preached that very difficult, jarring uh, grouping of words, he wrapped it up at the very end in Matthew 7, 24 by saying, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. They are like a person who builds their house on a solid rock. 
and then he's done. In other words, it's not just enough to say, this is what Jesus says about marriage. This is what Jesus says about lust. This is what Jesus says about turning the other cheek. That's really clever, Jesus. I love what you say. You got him. You got me there. Okay, I'm going to hate everybody you know, and punch him on my way out. You know. Jesus says it's not enough to listen, but to follow in it. This is apprenticeship, not a college lecture. In fact, James, who's the half-brother of Jesus, and I love this because James, it says in John chapter 7, one of the half-brothers of Jesus was following Jesus for a while, but at a certain point, he, left, he, he stopped following Jesus. He was one of the masses of disciples that just couldn't handle the things that Jesus was saying, and so he left. And yet somewhere along the way, probably at the resurrection and the outpouring of God's spirit, James came back. And James would eventually write a letter talking about his half-brother Jesus, the Messiah. And at one point he would say in James chapter 2, verse 14, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works, can that faith save him? In other words, is that faith even real? Faith includes a life that is changed and reoriented into the direction of a new master. You don't just believe that he exists and did some clever stuff. You are so compelled by this man that you're following in his footsteps, apprenticing Jesus. You are now his apprentice. I am going to leave the orientation, the direction, the ambitions that were contrary to, uh, to the kingdom of God. I'm going to leave those things and I'm going to follow this new master. The Bible says in our text, in verse 45, that those who do that, who take Jesus seriously enough to do what he says, to follow after him, will be blessed. What does blessing mean? That is a, that is a kingdom word right there. It speaks of a special favor from God coming upon people. Now, I'm not talking here about what you see on TV when people are talking about blessing on the late night uh, Christian channel. I'm not talking about preachers who are confusing material blessings and a trouble-free life with uh, obeying God and having faith in God. Saying to some effect, if you follow God, you'll never struggle in this life, you'll have two Bentleys and a huge home on the Mesa and everything will be fine. That is not the type of blessing that the Bible speaks of when it speaks about the kingdom of God. You may have that, you may not. Those personalities often conflate American values with God's values. God's values have to do with his rule and his reign stepping into your business. That is the biggest blessing you'll ever get in this life. That'll make money seem like a passing, fleeting entertainment. So when God says you are blessed, when it says at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, or in Luke, as we'll get to, he doesn't even say spirit, he says blessed are the poor. How can you be blessed if you're economically poor? Unless it has nothing to do with material blessings, but the rule and reign of God's kingdom coming upon you. Wasn't it also the half-brother of Jesus, James, who would say that God has chosen the poor of this world to be the richest in faith? How is that possible? Because God's getting at something different. He's bringing his kingdom to bear on people who need to be ruled and reigned by a great king. And it seems from the scriptures that it's often the poor who get that the quickest. And the rich that can learn from them some theological things. But make no mistake, when the Bible speaks about blessing, it is speaking about the royal king stepping into your life and taking over. In God's eyes, that is the greatest blessing a human could ever hope for. The Bible teaches that that blessing, the presence and the favor of God is closely correlated with believing and acting on God's word. For you to open up the word and to see something being said about you or about life or about people in general or about God and saying, that is so crazy, but you know, it might just work. I'm going to try it. I'm going to step out and try it. God is teaching here. You're blessed if you do that. Now, this is not a merit-based system, right? 
The, the Bible is not teaching if you believe, if you have enough faith, God will bless you and love you more in that sense. He's not saying for those who have enough faith, God will love you more. He'll love you so much that he'll actually give you some blessing. This is not a merit-based system. This is a posture. When you believe, you engage in a relationship that has already been made available to you by grace in, uh, in Christ Jesus. To kind of illustrate this, you know, I'm at this stage in my life with my kids. I have two kids, five and three, and I, I love them. And every night, Bree and I put them to bed, and it is our favorite time. And every night, my greatest hope at the end of the day is that one of them will ask for me to tuck them in and to just like, like be in their bed, like, you know, cuddle, you know, that kind of stuff. I never thought I would say that I would do. Like, I love it now. It's amazing. And it never happens. Because mom, mom steals all the glory. <laughs> and every night, for years, I try, I'm like, Jude, hey, Jude, how about my turn? And we call it, like, they have a short, shorthand for it. They call it mommy night or daddy night. What that means is, you get a turn. You get a turn with me, you know? You get to put me in bed, tuck me in, all of that stuff, sing songs, pray over me. And every time after dinner, I'm like, Jude, daddy night. So, mommy night. Well, okay, okay, I'll come back to you later. You'll change your mind. No, hey, Abby, Abby, daddy night? Mommy night? <laughs> over and over and over. There are some points where I try to manhandle my way. Before Brianna gets into the room, I'm like, okay, she's gone. I'm stepping in. This is my moment to shine. Jump in onto the covers. I'm like, here I am. I've been pushed out of beds before. Jude only weighs 25 pounds, man. He pushes me out of the bed. And I'm just, it's my, it's the worst. But there are, it just breaks my heart. They don't want me, they want their mom. Come on. Making me feel better. You're scratching the itch right now. It's really great. But there are those fleeting times in my life. And I don't know, it's usually, I don't know if it's related, but sometimes they have a fever or something like that, but where they're not thinking straight, <laughs> and I'll just get a break, and Abby's the best. She'll look at me, and she'll have a smirk on her face, and she's like, you want a daddy night? And I'm all, I want a daddy night all day long, forever, never mama night. I want to do this forever. And she's all, no, just tonight. <laughs> I'm all, okay, I'm going to do it. Now, when they ask me to do that, when they ask me for anything, are they somehow doing something that is meriting my favor and, and, and love? Absolutely not. I am waiting every day to give my kids anything that I have. I am waiting every day for daddy night, man. That is what I live for. I'll do it every day. I will just, I'll, I'll never leave their side if that were even possible. When they ask me for stuff like that, they're, they're not impressing me to the, to the effect that I'm now going to give them something that previously wasn't theirs. Uh, they, are, they are receiving what is already available to them. They're asking for something that's already theirs. This is what our faith can do. Because there's a passage in one of the Gospels in which we are told that if our earthly fathers as evil as they are are still somehow able to give us food when we ask for it, how much more will our heavenly Father give us good gifts when we ask him? When you, when you believe in his promises, when you ask him for, uh, for help in prayer, you gotta get rid of this mentality that I need to pray like the most theologically sound or impressive words. I've gotta stir up like some passion in my voice. If I get the wording just right, if I pray like a pastor, like that intercessor, then maybe I'll get a breakthrough. If I pray long enough, maybe I'll get God's attention. God is waiting to be with you. He has never left you. He is with you right now. What faith does is less on his behalf and more on ours. It opens up our heart for the activity of a God who is already to show, ready to show himself active on our behalf. What your faith does is it opens your life to the pre-existing activity of God that is already yours in Christ Jesus. 
I want to end by with this. Where do you put your faith? Because at this point, it might, it might sound like any number of things. Maybe you read the Bible and you're like, do I put my faith in myself? Just try harder? Is this like some moralistic thing? Like if you're not careful, you can read through the Bible and find a lot of commands. Maybe after doing that for enough, uh, enough times, you might be saying, Maybe I'm just supposed to have, like, pull myself up by the bootstraps and do all the right things, some type of moralism. Or maybe you might ask, well, maybe it's just faith in faith, like faith in, it, in believing. So if I believe enough in my own ability to believe, maybe something will happen. Up until this point in the story, it's been all about your faith or Mary's faith. And it might sound very self-centered, but here's the irony. Faith by nature is not about you but about something outside of you or someone outside of you. Look at verse uh, 41. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to throw out three quick things here. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is all about one thing. The Holy Spirit loves to make Jesus known to people revealing and showing people and gathering people around Jesus. Jesus himself would say this in John chapter 15, 26, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. I love uh, how one author described the spirit as the, the, shy, uh, the shy member of the Trinity because he's always making a big deal about Jesus and the Father. So one, Elizabeth is filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit loves to testify about Jesus. Two, this is when John the Baptist begins his ministry. He's not even born yet. God is already using him and filling him with the Spirit before he's born. John is the forerunner to Jesus. Remember when we read Luke chapter 1, verse 17? He will go on before the Lord to make ready a people prepared, prepared for the Lord. And as these two women meet and marry, who is about to give birth, who is about to conceive and have Jesus. Uh, just their, their interaction causes uh, the baby in Elizabeth's womb to leap inside of her womb and she's filled with the Spirit. Already before he's ever born, he already begins his ministry. Doing what? Making a big deal about Jesus. Third, we see Elizabeth high in stature, blessing lowly, poor, forgettable Mary. Why? Not due to any merit in herself, but because of Jesus. Look at what she says. Luke chapter 1, verse 42 through 43. She exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Again, her attention is on Jesus. This is a reversal of who's actually important. Elizabeth, high in stature, basically kneeling before Mary, a poor peasant woman. Why? God loves to reverse our ideas of who's important. And again, he's pointing, not even to Mary, but to the baby she will be carrying, Jesus. I hope this gives you enough glimpse into what's going on here, that there's only one person that this story is actually about. This is about Jesus. He hasn't even been born yet in the story, but it is unequivocally about Jesus. The whole Bible, we'll find out at the end of Luke uh, on the road to Emmaus, but I don't mind giving you a spoiler because it's going to take three years before we get to that story. <laughs> Jesus is on the road to Emmaus, and he's, he's, he's talking to his disciples after he rose from the dead. And it says in a, a particular section, he went through the, the, basically went through the Old Testament scriptures, telling them how the scriptures testified to him. Wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall of that Bible study? Jesus explaining how the whole Bible is about him. The Bible is a story about how God created everything, how sin ru uh, distorted some of those things, but he has a plan to redeem it through his son, Jesus Christ, and eventually make all things new so that his righteousness and justice will flow uh, freely like a stream. That is the story of God we see in the Bible, and Jesus is the hero of that story. Where do you put your faith? You put it in Jesus. John 3.16, some of, some of you know it. If you don't, just go to In-N-Out and buy a soda. 
Look at the bottom. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That eternal life thing isn't about length of years, although it includes that. It's about quality of years. It's about the blessing. Those who believe in Jesus and follow him will be blessed. So faith opens your heart to God's blessed activity in the spirit. It's cultivated by investigating what God said and did and it has Jesus as its primary focus. So what should we do as a church? We should get in this thing. We should get in the word. We should investigate it and we should do what it says with this motivation to know Jesus, to grow in Jesus, and to show Jesus to other people. And as you do it, I'm convinced because God says it, that your life will be changed in the way that God has designed and planned for your life to be changed by him. It might look different than the way that you designed for yourself, but it will be good. There's an itch in some of you that you just can't seem to scratch. Perhaps you woke up this morning with an itch. You don't know what it is, you don't know what it means, but it's bothering you, and you can't seem to satisfy it through the litany of ways that you have prescribed and tried. And I want you to question now if perhaps that is a God-given itch from the Lord who wants to get your attention. And if that's the case, and I believe that is the case for every single person who has ever lived, the uh, the book of Acts, also written by Luke, tells us that God put mankind on the earth so that they would seek after him in order to find him. Because in God, we live and move and have our being. We were created with an itch, in other words. And until you find that thing scratched in the Son of God, you will continue to try to reach it to no avail. Perhaps the reason that you're here this morning is to stop your search and to find your fulfillment and your purpose in the son of the living God who died on the cross and rose again to give you new life and to change your life from here on out. I'm gonna ask uh, Alex and the team to come out as we sing. And I want to leave you with this. You know, some of you, probably all of you have crazy schedules. And it doesn't matter what it is. If you live in Santa Barbara, you have a crazy schedule. It might be crazy because you have kids. It might be crazy because you have work. It might be crazy because you go to school, go to college. It might be crazy just because you have a to-do list that is unabated, unabated. You know what all of those things have in common? They will not help you get into the word of God. As much as I love my kids, they will not tell me to sit down in the corner for two hours and to contemplate the wonderful things of Jesus Christ. They do other wonderful things, which I love. But the currents of this life will not help you to slow down and be with Jesus. If I just wake up and hope that my relationship with God will happen, it will not. I need a plan. And unless you're in solitary confinement with a Bible and a reading lamp, you're going to need a plan too. You will not coast into a thriving, growing relationship with Jesus just by waking up tomorrow morning. Like anything worth doing for the rest of your life, whether it's losing weight or bodybuilding or studying or learning a craft, your faith will not just happen. You have to work at it. By the grace of God, you have to have a plan. I want to charge all of you today to come up with a plan for 2018. I'm telling you more than a month out because I want you to think about it and not just jump into something that you threw together because this is maybe the best thing that you're going to do in the year to come. We'll offer support for this. We have home groups. We have Bible studies. We have personal devotions. We'll have all of that stuff. Ultimately, it comes down to your faith-filled choice to not only believe in your mind, but believe in your heart and in your body. I am going to follow this guy because he is more compelling than anyone I have ever known in my life. Jesus, I'll give you a shot. I'll give you a try. 
you begin opening up his word and community and saying, line at a time. Let's see how this goes. Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. In other words, scratch the itch, my friends. And don't stop. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your abiding presence in your church today. You are present among your church as Revelation tells us that you uh, dwell among the lampstands, you dwell among the churches. There's nothing that we had to do on Saturday night or Sunday morning to beckon you to be with us. You are here because of the unmerited, tenacious, reckless love of God in you. So I just pray today that you would, by the power of your spirit, open our eyes to be aware of your presence, that you might change us from the ground up. We thank you that you have said some pretty incredible things throughout history. I pray that as we sing about the things that you have said and done, you would begin to kindle within our hearts, not just individually, but collectively as a church, to believe in the mighty and powerful and glorious purpose of God for the planet. Yet as cosmic as it is for the planet and for the universe, it even touches the one willing to leave the 99 to reach that one. So may we all be altered by the compelling power and nature of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.